new advances. What I'm going to be talking about today is really focusing on how to help in you in clinical practice to understand what the specific nutritional needs for your patients are, macronutrients and micronutrients. If we were to take a, uh, a quick poll of the audience, uh, how many people are taking nutritional supplements of some kind, and vitamins and minerals? And what we see is it's almost 100%. Um, across the nation, we see that it's about 80%. And yet many people are taking nutritional supplements not knowing, is this one really helping me? Do I need this one? Am I taking enough? Am I taking too much? How do I begin to tell? How do I determine what my specific micronutrient needs are? Vitamins, minerals, antioxidants. We're going to look at how to uh, sort that out. We're also going to talk about how we determine specifically what the macronutrient needs are. How do you know if someone is in protein deficiency going on? And, and what may be the source of that protein deficiency? Because we usually have adequate amounts of protein in our diet. We may not be breaking it down effectively in our gut in order to be able to give the proper amount uh, of essential amino acids. So we're going to figure out and uh, take a look at how to do that. Now, many people would say in this land of plenty that we have here in the United States, uh, there should be no reason for macronutrient and micronutrient deficiencies. And yet, if you, we look at the National Health and Nutrition Evaluation Survey, NHANES, which is done every five years, you go around the country, they uh, analyze uh, blood, urine, saliva, uh, do physical exams, biometric exams on individuals, what they find is that over 60% of the people in the United States have a deficiency of B vitamins. Um, so these, these micronutrients that are necessary cofactors for all of our enzymatic pathways are known to be deficient. In clinical practice, we've seen this. We've seen that supporting people with magnesium and zinc and B vitamins makes a difference. It helps to turn around chronic disease as well as helps to promote, promote uh, wellness and prevention. So we have the ability to begin to look at uh, objective data that we can offer to our, our patients to help them to see this is exactly what your needs are and this is how we can follow it up. We can use it to motivate the patients and, uh, and, and use that as a tool to really be able to individualize therapy. In case I'm going to uh, talk about it at the end, but I want to you know, set up the framework for it, is uh, one from my practice, a 42-year-old female who came in for uh, dealing with chronic fatigue. Now, she had been looking to go on... Um, work on disability. You know, she had been, she was a nurse, she was not able to work, uh, she was having a very difficult time, she came in for this evaluation, she was on some vitamins and minerals to help her out. Some fish oil, uh, a B50 complex, um, some magnesium, magnesium citrate wouldn't be the one I would use, those little packets of emergency. So she thought that she was taking the fish oil that she needed, the uh, antioxidants that she needed, and the B vitamins, and yet it wasn't helping her at all. Now, she'd been on uh, a tricyclic antidepressant for the pain related to this, uh, was currently on Prozac. So we took and evaluated her to understand what her specific individual biochemistry was and then made treatment recommendations based on that. And we'll see what, what happens with her over time. But as we look around the room, we look at the slide, we look around the room, it's difficult to sort of tell at a glance, well, which person is the one who's got an uh, optimized potential of the, the right mix of macronutrients, micronutrients, antioxidants, essential fats? Uh, how do we determine that? How do we figure out who the healthy person is in the audience? Well, the optimistic approach is that if we just eat you know, five fr fruits and vegetables a day, that we'll be able to get exactly what we need. And while this is important, in fact necessary to do, it's not sufficient. Because what we see when we, when we go ahead and we look at the data that we'll look at right here is that in the, 50, in the last 50 years, this study um, done in the, Amer in the Journal of uh, American College of Nutrition shows that there's a, def a deficiency. A deficiency in the foods, of in the nutrients as they're coming out of the earth. So we see in this assessment of various B vitamins, antioxidants, and minerals, we see that there is an average 20% fewer nutrients in the food as they're coming out of the earth. When we look at riboflavin, for example, 37% less riboflavin in our food 
than there was 50 years ago due to farming techniques, etc. Now, uh, further, further changes looking at minerals, we see that some uh, minerals such as zinc and calcium, there's a 50% decrease in the amount of those minerals in our food. 77% decrease in the trace mineral of copper. And we see that it goes across vegetables, fruit, meat, all these things. We see a 50% decrease in the iron that's available um, from, uh, in meat. So we have depletion of nutrients that are happening in the foods that we're getting in. Then we have the refrigeration techniques where we get apples from New Zealand that were picked six months ago, um, and, we, and that's what we have available in our stores. Uh, but the refrigeration techniques cause a loss in the antioxidant capacity. We know we can measure the ORAC potential of those foods, and they decline over time from the refrigeration process of getting it to, uh, to our grocery store. So that's from the farm to the to our home. What about in our home from the refrigerator to the kitchen table? Well, th these studies have been done looking at the decline, for instance, in vitamin C in a whole series of different foods, whether it's raw or boiled or canned. And we see that the, the, de the decrease from the yellow line, which is raw, uh, to the blue line, which is, which is if it's boiled, we see a, a decrease across a series of different kinds of uh, fruits and vegetables where the amounts of, of the nutrients of vitamin C are lost from the cooking process. Now, researchers from uh, NCI uh, would tell us that if we're looking to find the beneficial effects of uh, broccoli or the cruciferous vegetable family, that in order to optimize the, the, the anti-cancer effect, we would want to steam that broccoli for no more than 1.5 minutes any longer than that and we begin to lose the nutrients that are present and we lose the, the uh, anti-carcinogenic effect of the cruciferous vegetables. So we can find, here's thiamine, I showed vitamin C, here's, here's thiamine. Here's a comparison of what our DRI is, the daily recommended intake, that line down at the bottom looking at iron, uh, riboflavin, zinc, a whole series of different um, nutrients, and it's compared with a paleolithic diet, a caveman diet, if you will. And it's showing, the green line is showing what the caveman diet, the paleolithic diet, had in it in terms of nutrients. That's what our cells are used to seeing. That's not the DRI, the daily recommended intake, which is the amount that's necessary to prevent, you know, beriberi and pellagra and scurvy. Now, that's ridiculous to set these as what our nutrient levels should be.